you'll turn with me to Ezra chapter 7, read, read this uh, section to bring your attention to when was it, or at what point in the book of Ezra did Ezra actually come on the scene, and when is he going to be coming into Jerusalem? Ezra chapter 7. We said that Cyrus made that decree, and so this will be some time later, um, a, a good bit later, we have Ezra coming into Jerusalem. Ezra chapter 7. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sarariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Meraoth, son of Jerariah, the son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a skill, he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes king, some of the people of Israel, some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came up to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the, of the God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand and also carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, who dwell, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. With all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia and with the free will offerings of the people and the priests, bowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then, you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that you have been given for the service of the house of God you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem, whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. Let us pray. Father, your word is powerful. It is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides our uh, thoughts, even the intentions of our hearts, um, very deep it cuts. And so we pray that this day your word would work within us and that indeed we would love your word um, because it comes from you and we could learn from your word and we would now then later be able to live in light of your word, more conformity to your truth for your glory. And so open up your word to us even now. It's through Jesus, the word that became flesh, that I pray this prayer. 
Amen. Ezra. We come to Ezra, and this is directly following 2 Chronicles. So we know that the Chronicles had a record of Adam to Cyrus, king of Persia's decree for the Lord's people to go back into the land and to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. That's the direction that we're headed. We said that the people were out of the land because of their sin and uh, turning away from the Lord. Judgment came upon them, so God gave the kingdom of Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And you have, thus you have the Babylonian captivity. That um, The date and the timing, if you want to put that into perspective, in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed, the people of Judah exiled to Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar was king. That's where we're coming up to this point. But who, who um, and we saw that at the end of 2 Chronicles and the beginning of Ezra chapter 1, basically the same words are written about Cyrus, king of Persia. And we'll look in more detail at those words in a moment. But nonetheless, the Lord has worked in him in such a way, stirred his spirit to send the people back that the temple might be rebuilt. Who wrote Ezra? Um, well, first person is used. Um, Ezra chapter 7 and following through chapter 9. Um, so no doubt, Ezra, these are the direct words of Ezra. He says, I, um, you know, the Lord has blessed me. You can turn there if you, if, just to see it. Ezra chapter 7, verse 27. If you turn too far, you might go to Nehemiah chapter 7, so you'll have to come back into the book. And so, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors, before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered up leading men from Israel to go up with me. And so uh, the words of Ezra in the first person and then following through the beginning of chapter 9 when he talks about this prayer that he prays and then he's and Ezra includes the rest of those that have come back into the land as he begins to pray there in chapter 9. Ezra certainly is thought to be the author by many, even though he doesn't show up until chapter 7. Uh, whoever certainly that was the author had access to documents and records that were um, of the Persian um, Empire, they could get access, they could see what were the previous decrees, such as Ezra chapter, chapter 1, beginning with Cyrus's decree. Uh, the timing, what's taken place, what has taken place, and what is going to take place through the book of Ezra. I said that the Jerusalem was taken 586 B.C., and so the exile began, but then in 538 to 537 B.C., Ezra, be Ezra begins, the book of Ezra begins with Cyrus, Cyrus's decree to rebuild the temple and that the people may go back into the land. And so you have roughly 50 years there that has elapsed of this exile, and then this, this also is when the first return takes place. There's going to be a series of three returns for people coming from captivity and exile and returning back into the promised land or coming back into Jerusalem. The first one happens shortly thereafter, Cyrus's decree. Um, the first return to Judah and Jerusalem was under Zerubbabel's leadership. And then, um, as far as timing goes, 516 B.C., the second temple is completed. So they're charged to build the temple um, under Cyrus's decree, and then roughly 20 years later, this, the second temple is, is completed. And now you have Darius, king of Persia, um, in power during that time. 
And then finally, I said the first, there'll be three returns back to the land. The, the second will be with Ezra, Ezra chapter 7. Artaxerxes is king of Persia, and that takes, takes place in five, 458 B.C. So this is quite a bit of time that's elapsing within the book of Ezra. Uh, and then we know that Ezra was a contemporary to Nehemiah, will be what we're going to go to next week. And um, so Ezra was there as the third return with Nehemiah will take place, and we'll see more of that, the details next week. So the timing. This is leading us up, and of course you know we're counting down. We're getting closer and closer to the coming of Christ. And we say countdown literally as in um, before Christ, we, we see uh, that the time, uh, the, the way the years were recorded, we see them coming down. And we can also begin to understand what is the situation in the time of Christ as far as uh, there's a foreign king that's made, it's in power and control of the land of Israel, and they send people, the people of God can come back, but nonetheless, they're still going to have their own governors, and, and Israel's not going to be an independent or sovereign nation ever again. Um, we'll see, see that in, even as Christ comes um, in, into the land, because they're, they're still under the foreign rule at that time. So Ezra it gives us some, you, you're starting to hit, hear some of the theme there. What is the, the, the theme? The theme is going to be return and rebuild. Return and rebuild. What are we rebuilding? Well, the temple is going to be the focus in Ezra. Um, the law of the Lord and the, the worship of the Lord being reestablished. So the reestablishment of the worship of the Lord in Jerusalem. We'll also see... Uh, the protection and the providence of the Lord is necessary in the midst of opposition. All of these things um, should be an encouragement to us um, as we see the Lord's work, how he is behind it all. For any of this to take place, it's got to be the work of God. Um, it wasn't as though Cyrus just had um, all of a sudden, this crazy idea that popped up in his mind, and I say, I want to reinstate, he, he didn't say, I just want to reinstate the, the worship of the Lord over there in Jerusalem. We're going to find out that the Lord was behind it. And also another theme I would say that is pointed out and should be brought out to our attention is devotion should be to the Lord alone. Uh, as we hear these themes, I hope that you are... Uh, starting to make some connections with Christ, connections with your own life uh, before the Lord. Return, rebuild, reform, be devoted to the Lord alone, and uh, the Lord is behind it all. If there's any blessing upon a people, uh, it's ultimately going to be the work of God. So rebuild the temple. Uh, as far as the theme goes, the Lord stirred the spirit of a foreign king. Uh, so that this foreign king would approve of and support the rebuilding of the temple. Why is the rebuilding of the temple important? I've kind of brought attention to this over the last couple weeks uh, because we don't make too much of the temple these days, right? So why is that important though in Ezra? It's important to reestablish the worship that the Lord prescribed at that time. The Lord chose Jerusalem to be the place where he would be worshipped. He, he centralized the place of worship. You think about through the history of Israel previously. Of course, they were traveling around with the tabernacle. We know that um, there had been some varied locations that had been set up. But no, the Lord says, and, and it leads up to it as you read the history, the place where I will choose. Even as far back as Deuteronomy says, when the Lord chooses a place for his name to dwell. So centralized worship of the Lord, the Lord chose Jerusalem to take place and for that temple ultimately to be built there where the priests were responsible to maintain the purity of worship. Um, that was a problem. Impurity coming in upon the worship was a problem in Israel. And so at that time, God chose, we're going to have it centralized. We're going to have these priests that are going to be assigned to oversee it and maintain this purity. In the midst of all of this, I said, we see the protection and the providence of the Lord is necessary. 
there is going to be opposition. There was opposition to rebuilding the temple. The people who were in the land, the people of the land, they did not want the Israelites to become powerful as they had been in times past. And naturally, it's like, oh no, not them again. Because what we know about the uh, the kingdom, the throne of David, and we knew about the reign of Solomon. I mean, they, that was the dominant force. And those people that were not uh, the Lord's people, they didn't want this to happen by any means. At one point, the work on the temple even ceased because of the opposition. And in spite of all this opposition, the Lord proves that He can overcome and accomplish all His holy will. <laughs> he can do all things um, he can't accomplish all his holy will and and finally devotion to the lord alone the lord's people have a continual temptation to become attached to the things of this world there seems to be always that temptation and pull uh, one situation we see in ezra the prominent one are pagan wives uh, that come come up so the lord's people must continually turn to the lord away from the world and false worship and idolatry. They must turn away from those things and turn back to the Lord. Devotion to the Lord alone. I hope that the Lord will show us areas today, uh, even in our own life, as we learn about the history here, um, that the Lord would show us the areas that we're being tempted to go the way of the world. And oh, may He bring us back. And so an outline, how could you outline Ezra in a simple way? Two divisions, verses one, or excuse me, chapters one through six, return and rebuild the temple. And the, again, the prominent person, the leader in that time was Zerubbabel. That's the first division. And then chapters seven through 10, return and reform. And this is Ezra as the, as the prominent person there that's, that's highlighted. So first, return and rebuild the temple. In chapter 1, we see the return to Jerusalem. How did this return come about? It was Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Uh, even not, he wasn't just stirred in spirit. He made a proclamation, and it even got, it was written down. So, what did the Lord say through Jeremiah? Um, what's the reference that would be to this? Turn with me to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25. As we get into the prophets, we will um, we will see and be able to make connections back, and 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 it will. I hope will be an encouragement as we. See the unity of Scripture. But what did Jeremiah say? Verse 11, Jeremiah 25, verse 11. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So what did Jeremiah say? One thing that Jeremiah had prophesied was is that there, there would ruin would come upon the land of Judah, upon Jerusalem. Uh, that would come by the hand of the Babylonians. But then there would be a 70-year period, and, and then actually the Babylonians would be judged. Um, and they were. The Persians took over, and Babylonia was no longer in power. Also, turn to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, verse 36. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. 
I will bring them back to this place. I will make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And the Lord, through Jeremiah, says there's going to be 70 years of time outside the land, and then there'll be a time of gathering the people back into the land. And so, back to Ezra, um, how does God do this, bring these things to pass? It's stirring up that foreign king. This happened by the Lord stirring the spirit, and he made the decree. We see that in chapter 1, verse 2, and following. And so, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And whoever is among all of his people, may his God be with him, let him go up to Jerusalem." which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. And so the Lord charged Cyrus to build him a house at Jerusalem. The Lord's house at Jerusalem is the temple. So the Lord charged Cyrus to rebuild the temple. Cyrus was not the only person stirred by the Lord, though. There's got to be a lot of stirring taking place here. Verse 5 of chapter 1. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. This is wonderful work of God, stirring in the spirit. A lot of times, again, we get mechanistic in the sense of, or we get outward in our form and we say, well, we just need to do this because... Uh, it's the right thing to do. But you see God working within. And, and then something starts happening. Um, the Lord is stirring in these, in these folks. So the exiles return to Jerusalem and they come with many vessels that had previously been taken out of the house of the Lord. Also, they came with other costly goods and animals. So they brought some wealth with them in, in chapter 1 and this work needs to take place. And Ezra, again, this section, what are, we, what are we calling it? It's return and rebuild. And so chapter 2, we see who returned. The people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants. In summary, you can look at verse 64 of Ezra chapter 2. Ezra chapter 2, verse 64, the whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337. And they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736. Their mules, 245. Their camels were 435. And their donkeys were 6,720. So a lot of people are returning to the land. Every single individual didn't go into Jerusalem at that point. Some of them went back to their allotted places and their land um, in Judah there. But what did they come with? It, it talks about, of course, the number of people. It talks about the animals. I would have to say that if you wanted to have the most useful animal um, to go about life in this day what would it be just based on the numbers it seems like the donkeys the the prominent one i've heard uh, someone describe the donkey in this day as the four-wheel drive pickup um, of that time because they could carry the load and and help you out with the work so everyone didn't live in jerusalem they even returned to some of the, their allotted lands Chapter 3, as we're, as we're looking through Ezra, we're just seeing how this unfolds. We get some of the details. Of course, there's, again, a, a listing of people who return. But then in chapter 3, the altar was rebuilt at Jerusalem. And so uh, we see, like in the second half of verse 2, they built the altar of God of Israel and to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for the fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. So they, they began to regularly call upon the Lord, offer up this, these sacrifices as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, uh, 
and then we find that once the altar is, is built or rebuilt, then the temple uh, work begins. The foundation was laid. And what a task. What a task. Even though there's a lot of people coming in, for sure, this is, this is quite a task. The rebuilding of the temple began. The foundation was laid. Some people were shouting for joy. And others wept who had seen the first temple. I guess um, there's different ideas on this. Some say that some of the weeping could have been based on the fact that it wasn't, wasn't they knew that it wasn't going to have the splendor of the temple that, that King Solomon had built. But nonetheless, many people are very joyful. Why? Why would you get so excited about this? It is because this is where the worship of God should take place. This is where God chose to meet with His people. And a person that has been stirred in their spirit by the Lord, who has a desire for the Lord, wants to meet with the Lord. And so they would be joyful that this is this place of meeting with God, this place of worship of the one true and living God, this is happening. Um, chapter 4, some people living in the land opposed the rebuilding of the temple. And the truth is, is that the Lord's people became afraid even. And so look at chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so we see the opposition that arises. Uh, you're familiar with, with what went on, I'm sure, but I'll just remind you that, that there was much, much opposition. In, in chapter 4, the timeline continues on opposition. It's, it's as if the author got, on, got in their mind, oh, what opposition has taken place to uh, the people of the Lord. Um, and so actually, there's a, there's a step further in history, um, as far as from the building of the temple, we see the timeline continuing. If you want to have a chronological order, you would have to read it. In chapter 4, you'd have to read up to verse 5, and then you'd have to go all the way to the end of the chapter to verse 24. If you just want to read it in straight chronological order. But actually, from verses 6 through 23, there's kind of a uh, late, uh, there are, there's a later opposition that's described that's been inserted or they put into the text there. Um, and how so? Well, if you want to go from verse 5, which I said, you know, opposition um, took place as up to verse 5, reign of Darius, king of Persia, and then look at verse 24, then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year in the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so that was the opposition. The work stopped on the house and then it resumed. We find um, the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Well, what about verses six through seven? How does this fit? Well, verse six speaks of Ahasuerus, which he reigned from 485 to 464 B.C., uh, spoken of in the book of Esther. You're familiar with this? But as I, I, I know the dates sometimes are hard to hold together, but the temple building was actually completed in 516. And so this opposition that's mentioned in verse 6 actually took, late, it took place later. The reign of Hasuerus, the beginning of his reign, wrote accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And then next, verses 7 through 23, we have King Artaxerxes, um, an opposition to stop the work of rebuilding the city and the walls. It's not, not stopping the work of rebuilding the temple, but rebuilding Jerusalem up and all the walls around it. And King Artaxerxes was from 464 until 423 B.C., his reign there. So opposition is pointed out. If you were to read straight through it, you would be scratching your head saying, how does this all work together timeline? It's not in chronological order. This is, think of chapter four, opposition, 
And the writer includes opposition that happened in later times. Uh, if you have any more questions about that late, uh, at the end of the service, just ask me. And so the work ceased, but then uh, the rebuilding begins in, in chapter 5. Rebuilding begins, we find in verse 1, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in, Jerus in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the Lord, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. You need to go and at least Haggai, after tonight or in the morning, when you have a moment, go back and read Haggai, the prophet. And you're going to see the, the perfect connection, but it's Ezra chapter 5 right there. Haggai comes on the scene, and what is Haggai doing? Encouraging the folks to the work. He's encouraging the folks to the work on the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, we do find, though, that opposition comes again. Uh, Tatanai wrote a letter to King Darius asking him to stop the building of the temple. Tatanai's opposition is different from some previous opposition. More, more like this is the opposition. I want to see if you really have uh, permission from the leadership, um, the, if you really have permission from the king of Persia to be doing this work. The Israelites responded to that tonight uh, chapter, in Luke in chapter 5, verse 11, and this is what they say. Ezra 5, 11. There were, this was their reply to us. So they're writing the letter appealing to, to Darius, and they say, this is what they told us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which the, a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed his, this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year... Of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus, may, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. And so, again, Tethanai wasn't getting nasty about this, um, but they, they did request that actually there be a search made in the archives, see if this is a legitimate thing taking place, and it was. They found in the record. So chapter 6, verse 6, what did they find? Now, therefore, Tatanai, governor of province, province beyond the river, and Sheth Shethar, Bozani, and your associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Don't hinder these people from the rebuilding of the temple. That, that's the result. Um, the temple was finished. Uh, we find in chapter 6, many animals were sacrificed, much celebration took place, and the Passover is celebrated. Once again, um, the Passover is celebrated, the temple has been rebuilt, there's great joy. What do we find in the Passover being celebrated? Look at verse 19. On the 14th day of the first month, the return to exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean, so they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles and their fellow priests for themselves. It was, and, and this is important to note. Who is participating in this Passover? It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanliness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, I think that's, and it says, verse 22, they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of, and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God the God of Israel. God, in the midst of opposition, is working. God provides a way. Yes, did the work cease for a time? It did. But nonetheless, God sent His prophets to encourage the people, continue on building. 
when, when some form of opposition rose up, then the Lord provided a way, even in the record, where it said they could see, oh yes, we read back and Cyrus did make this decree that this should be rebuilt. And so Darius in his second year says, Tatanai, don't, don't persecute these people. Keep away from them. Let them do the building. The temple is built. The temple is dedicated. The Passover is celebrated. And, and great worship to God is being offered up. Who's included in the worship? Of course, the returned exiles. We know their spirit has been stirred. We want to go all the way back to Jerusalem. We want to re uh, rebuild the temple, reestablish the worship. We love the Lord. And there were other people. There were people, it says there in verse 21, who had joined them, separating themselves from the uncleanness of the people of the land. They say, we want to worship the Lord too. And so when we get to the very end of Ezra and we see these these marriages to foreign women and you think oh this is just um, a terrible thing they're 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 uh, just trying to exclude all these foreigners and everything the truth is had those women not been idolaters this would not have been an issue uh, because even celebrating the past passover people were able to come in and turn away from uh, the peoples of the lands and the way they were worshiping, they cleanse themselves and say, we want to worship the Lord, the true and living God. That's a great encouragement. So we see return and rebuild, and God accomplishes this through these people. Then in chapter 7, Ezra comes on the scene, our second major division, the return and reform. Ezra. We meet him, chapter 7, he brought another group back to the land. What will Ezra do in the promised land? Look at verse 10 of chapter 7. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. He came to minister the word of God to be a representative of the Lord, to uphold what the Lord had said previously, um, what had been recorded and written down. And so, you know, you can say the law of the Lord, um, the, the Lord used Moses to write down, uh, however you wish to, to say it. But that was what he's dedicated himself to. Because if we're going to have proper worship, we, at that time they needed the altar, they needed the temple, they needed to be celebrating the Passover, and they needed the law of the Lord. Let's, we can't compromise in any area. And so there's Ezra. We'll find again more of that in, ne in Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah. Artaxerxes the king made a decree that Ezra was in charge and that he would support the work. Again, this is a wonderful um, example of how God is working, even in foreign kings. Return and reform. Chapter 8, there's a genealogy of those that return to the land. We see that there's fasting and prayer that the Lord would protect them even as they travel back to the land. This is something of an interesting thing. If you say you believe that God is the God of heaven and earth and he rules over all things, how are you going to live? Well, Ezra was felt ashamed to think that he needed to ask of the king a, an, an armed... Uh, an armed bodyguard on the transfer back into the land. Look at chapter 8, verse 21. Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahavla, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek Him, seek from Him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way. Since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. This is a, a wonderful uh, perspective. Again, uh, he's ashamed. Yeah, he, would, he was ashamed because he says, if I make this request for this armed band to uh, guard us on the way, then I'm really saying that, I, that the Lord's not powerful um, and that the Lord is not um, able to protect us and to bring us into the land. So just, just something we learn along the way.
If you find yourself in a dangerous situation, uh, Pastor Mark made reference to prayer this morning, not if you can't do this, at least pray. And Pastor Mark made reference, and I think this passage teaches us, is that prayer is more powerful than many other means that we uh, lean on many times. May we learn this. Uh, again, we want to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, um, but no doubt, let's err on the side of trust and dependence upon the Lord um, rather than depending upon the arm of the flesh in whatever situation we're in. And uh, verse 35 of chapter 8, we see at that time those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the Lord of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. So we see that this worship continues to take place. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? In the midst of opposition, uh, the people are depending upon the Lord. The Lord is protecting them. The Lord is uh, paving the way, if you will, opening up the, the reestablishment of the worship. But the truth is, is all was not well in Israel. All was not well. And so in chapter 9, we find out that there are some men who have married unbelievers. They have married idolaters. And uh, let me just take a quick look. Uh, let me read a portion of chapter 9. After these things had been done, all this worship of the Lord taking place, after all these things had been done, officials approached me, Ezra, and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations, from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, the Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief priests has been foremost. So it's not just everybody in the, in the population, but even the leaders, officials, and chief men have been leading the way, if you will, in this sinful act. As soon as I heard this, Ezra says, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of God, the God of Israel, because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles, gathered around me while I sat appalled till the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn, and I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O Lord, or O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt." For our, and for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, to, and to utter shame as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery, for we are slaves. You see, Ezra knew <laughs> that the nation hadn't been reestablished. They, they still were under the control of a foreign king and foreign powers. He says in verse 9, Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments. <laughs> In light of all this blessing that we've received here, verse 11, which you commanded by your servants the prophets, saying, The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with iniquity of the peoples of the lands. 
with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanliness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace and prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us, listen to this, less than our iniquities deserved, have given us such a remnant as this. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. Sin affected Ezra. He saw the sinfulness. He says, we have done this. He hadn't done it himself, but his people and the ones that he was trying to bring the law of the Lord to and to teach in Israel. And so this happened. The reality is, is that great sin can arise among the people of God. It caused him great shame. <laughs> even, in the, even in the midst of his shame, he knew, though, that they had not been punished as much as their iniquities deserved. The mercy of God is on display in that statement in prayer because he knew and we should know. Even temporally, we've not been uh, re received the consequences of our sin as we ought. And so what is the response? We find in chapter 10 that they came, verse 2, Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, the son of of the sons of Elam addressed Ezra, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now, there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task and we are with you. Be strong and do it. We want to repent. We've confessed our sin. We want to repent. And the solution is going to be to put away these wives. And you say, well, what kind of solution is that? It's better than the alternative. Killing all the men and all the women that took, took part in this. It seems as though a more merciful solution was found. Dissolve these marriages because they're, they're unjust rather than kill them all. Ezra, Ezra the priest stood up before them. Verse 10 we see where Ezra says, You have broken faith and married foreign women and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now, verse 11, Then make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do His will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. So return and reform is what we see. And there is in chapter 10 a list of those who married unbelievers that concluded the chapter. But application and conclusion, we need to see that it is the will of the Lord that he be worshipped. It is the will of the Lord that he be worshipped. He accomplishes this in a surprising way. We saw the Lord stir the spirit of a foreign king who supported the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem where the Lord was worshipped. And it is no doubt the will of the Lord that he is worshipped. So think about Ezra, but also let's think about ourselves. It is the will of the Lord that he be worshipped. And he accomplished, he accomplished this in a surprising way. He sent his only begotten son, beloved son, to suffer in the place of sinners so that rebellious sinners might be made fit worshippers of God. Sinners cannot worship the Lord because they don't have that a heart they, to be engaged in worship. A sinner cannot do that. They're dead in their sins and trespasses. Christ came that the sinner might have new life, be forgiven by the shed blood of Christ, be justified and accepted in God's sight by the perfect righteousness of Christ, be born again and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, now able to worship God. 
You say all the, all the things that God accomplished in order for his worship to be reestablished in Ezra. God has done more in our day. For he has sent his son to establish true worship. Not because today our worship is not based upon a powerful foreign king who supported the efforts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. But it's, we're able to worship God because of the most powerful king of kings. He suffered and he laid down his life that sinners can be made spiritually alive to worship God. You might think that would have been wonderful to be one of the returned exiles. Yes, in that day, if you had been stirred by the Lord in your spirit and you had a desire for the worship of the Lord, that would have been a wonderful thing. How much more have we been blessed to have worship of God to be reinstated and made possible by the finished work of Christ? We can have a new heart through Him. We also saw that opposition to the worship of the Lord comes in multiple forms and many fronts. It was the peoples of the land who did not want the people of the Lord to rebuild the temple, to reestablish the worship of God. They tried to distract them. They tried to stop their efforts. Even for a time, they caused the work to cease. But in the end, the Lord kept the work going that the worship of the Lord might be renewed. For us, opposition to the worship of the Lord comes on multiple fronts. The children of the devil do not want the people of the Lord to worship him. The sons of disobedience don't want the children of light to live among them, shining the light of Christ. So for the Christian, there will be much opposition in your attempts to live a life of worship of the Lord. Thanks be to God that Jesus keeps his people he keeps them going. He, he, he keep, enables them in the midst of opposition. Christ said of the disciples, and I would say that it, it transfers over to all of his followers. I have given them your word. It's in his prayer in John 17. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. What opposition do you think is so strong that you cannot live a life of worship of the Lord? There is not, there's no, no opposition um, greater than the Lord himself to keep you and to enable you and me to continue to live for him and to worship him above all things. So do not be afraid or do not be discouraged Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Also, opposition to the worship of the Lord comes in multiple fronts. We saw that it was a sinful choice of the returned exiles to marry the foreign women, the women who were idolaters, women who did not worship the Lord, who, hindered, who were hindering the people of the Lord from worshiping him. So the Lord raised up a voice of truth to tell the sinfulness of these mixed marriages. Mixed marriages, you do understand what I'm saying. This is a marriage to an idolater, not to a believer of the Lord. And there was a call for repentance from sin, dissolve these marriages, which was, again, as I mentioned, more, a more merciful solution than putting to death um, of all those involved. So today... Opposition to the work of the Lord comes when we mix with the world. Mixing with the world leads to impurity in the worship of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord tells us the truth that we are to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and strength. The Lord is gracious to continually call us to repentance, continually confessing our sins. We know if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He calls us to continual faith, trust, and dependence upon Christ. We find that the just shall live by faith. And so, the Lord is to be worshipped. Return. Rebuild. You say, oh, I'd like to really get involved in a building project so I can get closer to the Lord. Well, we need, what we need to get involved with is 
um, being strengthened by the word of God, being strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, for it is only through Christ can we be proper worshipers. It's only by the indwelling spirit of Christ upon us that we're going to be stirred up to this proper worship. But don't, don't be surprised. There is much opposition. There will be much opposition. It will come in many forms. There will be uh, many people that try to get your attention to go another way and distract you from living for the Lord alone and worshiping the Lord. Um, hear the warning. Be guarded. Don't get involved in a marriage or for that matter in any seriously close relationship. Some Christians guard themselves so far as even saying business relationships. They are very careful about how they mix with the world because they do not want to be um, influenced in, a sinful, in any sinful way. The Lord graciously calls us to repentance, confession of our sin, and renewed faith in Christ, for the just shall live by faith. The Lord is to be worshipped, and the Lord enables His people to worship. <laughs> Again, this is not a power of positive thinking or a motivational speech to just do better. And worship the Lord more. You can't apart from Him enabling you to do it. So draw near. And let us worship the Lord. Let's pray. Father, if we learn anything from this word, it is that You... You alone are to be worshipped. Thank you, Lord, that uh, it is your will. Thank you, Lord, that you have raised up a people for yourself, um, a treasured possession. You love them dearly, and your people love you. Oh, but when I say that, Lord, I confess that there are many ways that we fall short of worshipping as you as you ought, as we ought to worship you. And so, Lord, may we be encouraged that you provided everything that was necessary for your worship to be reinstated. You continually uh, worked in the spirit even of a foreign, a foreign kings. You made a way. Uh, you even brought a voice of truth through your prophets and through uh, Ezra, the priest. We are thankful that you have brought to us or sent the, the great high priest, Jesus. And uh, he is that mediator between God and men. So, we rejoice in Christ this day, for we confess without Him we are nothing. We confess that our worship is empty and vain, repetition, apart from the indwelling Spirit of Christ. And so we ask that the blessings of Christ will be upon us, not for our own glory, but so that we can glorify You in a greater measure. 